Hi. <laughs> Welcome to Shrinkout. I'm Allison Colarossi here with Dr. David Colarossi, and we are on episode 25. Yes, we are. Right after a red eye flight. How do we look? I think you, well, you look wonderful. Do you like it? This is a new dress. Stitch fix? <laughs> I love stitch fix. Not an ad. <laughs> just love it. Uh, keeps me current. Mm -hmm. um, we just got back from a red eye flight of Hawaii. By the way, we had the most nightmare journey, like the most amazing trip and the most nightmare journey home. But yeah. <laughs> you know, so here's the, I feel like it's, people always go on Hasht and they complain. Hold they, on. Hashtag hate united. Yeah. Hashtag get closer to the microphone. <laughs> I feel like the, people always go, you know, this is how this airline is horrible or, you know, screw United. And the reality is United does not care. I mean, we, they've got enough money. They're a big enough organization. It, it, whatever, 200 people that are pissed off makes no, does not move the needle for them. No. But it was a nightmare. Will, you, will you tell the story nightmare. so they can understand? All right. So we have a direct flight from Kona to Denver. Mm -hmm. um, and that flight departs at, like, let's just say, I think it departed at like 8.15 p.m. So we get to the airport, whatever, at 6.30 or something like that. We're waiting there, and we're, we are getting, we, we are lining up to board, and we hear over the announce the, uh, the intercom, hey, uh, when, our, when this plane arrived from Denver, uh, when it landed, it popped a tire. And I guess what they didn't figure out is that when the plane, if you lose one tire on a plane, you have to replace both that tire and the other like in, like in a car, if you lose your, if you pop your back tire, you got to replace both tires. Well, in Kona, they only had one spare tire for all of the planes. <laughs> and so they had to, like, they couldn't, it's not just at Kona, they couldn't find another tire. Anywhere on the big island, they had no plane tires. So they had to get one flown in from Oahu, which meant that they had to find a tire in Oahu, charter a flight, have the tire, bring the, the, have the flight, bring the, the tire in put it on the plane. So they do all of that. We're delayed by three hours. Then we're getting ready to get back on the plane again. And they go. And they wait, hold on. They knew at three, they didn't decide to change the tire and have this yes, all happen to seven. So, so it's three hours later. Yes. Yeah, so the plane landed at three, blew a tire. <laughs> they didn't figure out that there was a problem until we were boarding at eight o'clock. And then they, anyway, so now we're at 11. They've got the new tires in the plane and then they go, Oh, we're going to be a little bit delayed. We are feel, we're going to fuel the plane. Now, I, I assume that it is harder to jack up a plane to replace the tire if you've got gas in it. So mm -hmm. that's the reason why there was... And I feel like they probably could have done it. There could be a little bit of multitasking here. But they're, but they're delayed again because they didn't plan how long it would take to fuel the plane up. They fuel the plane up and then they... No, they us, couldn't because of fuel. I'll tell. Oh. I'll, I'll tell. So then they, they, they say the plane is fueled up. Hop in line again. We're getting in again. We're boarding for the third time. And they go, oh, captain says the plane is too hot to board. So they didn't think while they were changing the tire or supposedly fueling the plane to turn on the AC. So we had to wait again. So now we're, it's midnight. And they're still delayed. Well, it turns out that they actually never were able to fuel the plane because the power panel for the fuel hatch was broken. And there was no mechanic at the airport that late that would be able to fix that particular panel. So we're just waiting there as they're sort of scouring the airport trying to find <laughs> anybody that knows how to Can open I this panel. Can I add some color? You may, yes. By the way, there's no stores for water. The vending machines are out of water. There's like 200 people with no water or food for that long. It was a nightmare. It was a, yeah, that is not a robust airport. And it's outdoors. The terminal is outdoors and we're getting torrential downpour. So, yeah, so, they, so they end up going, so we are waiting there and they're, they're, then they go, okay, we're going to get it fixed and then we're going to fly you into San Francisco because since we've been so delayed, the pilots that are there have now timed out and they can't fly to Colorado. So we're going to make you do a layover in San Francisco. Fortunately, they could never open the fuel panel. So they had to just cancel the flight, but they cancel it at 2 a.m. 2 a.m. Then you've got everybody there in Kona that has nowhere to go. So... I mean, then they, they turn people. the lights off in the airport, kicking us out. Yeah, because the, the, it was dangerous for us to be in the airport, so they just turned the <laughs> lights off. So it was a freaking night. It took us, I mean, we didn't get to the hotel until 4. Some people got there at four, 5. 4 in the morning. It was it was so bad, and I feel like United did nothing. And there was no, there, there was no great leadership to help. Like, 
I feel like the the manager in charge was doing her best, but she couldn't get hotels to people or transport. There's no transportation to the hotels. We had all turned in our cars. The car rentals were closed. Um, yeah. It was awful. Which parts in particular? The incompetence of United Airlines in the rain in an open air terminal. Nowhere to go. So it is now we're at now we're at 2 a.m. Take a look at this. Everybody's still sitting here. United still hasn't ha found a way to get anybody a hotel or give anybody any kind of transportation. Enzo is passed out here on a bench. And we're just waiting. Lena's being held by Renee. Just a disaster. My sense is that United is just pushing this off until the morning so they don't actually buy anybody uh, hotel rooms. That's what it feels like. With, when we were traveling with Lena, our three-year-old, who just like literally fell asleep standing up. Yeah, so Lena was... I, mean, I felt like we were in a bad position because we had little kids. But the friends that we were, that we were with had his parents there who were 86 years old you know and there's people there with oxygen on that had nowhere to go they had just had to sit in the seat all night it torrential totally, downpour yeah. not much covering no food no water of uh, when they turned off the lights i like got kind of aggressive and i feel bad but i was like you better turn those on because we can't be you can't just kick us out of here okay allison gets very aggressive it's not i feel like we killed the game and we were able to get out of there before a lot of people. Yeah, anyway. but So anyway, it was a nightmare. <laughs> Thankfully, we, due to Allison and our friend's assertiveness, we were like one of the first families out of there, went to the Sheridan, and we had a good day the following day, right? The extra day in Hawaii was good. Yeah, the extra day. But United, get it together. That was poor leadership. And you really need to um, allow your people. This is directly to you, to the president of United. Allow your people to make executive decisions. When you have 200 people in an airport, do not make them wait for vouchers to get them out of... Just empower your person with a credit card to pay for hotel rooms. Because, like, that seemed extremely unsafe to me. The older... Yeah. That guy with COPD, like, just laying on a yeah. bench at 5 in the morning, yeah. hoping somebody, his oxygen would stay... Yeah, if somebody died in that airport, that uh, would have been... And a, I just feel yeah. like, empower your people. There is smart people. Anyway, you're that, but but other than that, like we, we before that, we were like, wow, this trip went pretty great. Yeah. So, what was your what was your favorite part of the trip? Oh my gosh, so many parts. There are so many good parts. I loved snorkeling with Enzo and Lino. Yeah. Um, I thought snorkeling there was way better because we've been to Kauai before, which is I think a prettier island, but the snorkeling in Kona was way better. I thought. I don't we might, understand why it's way better, but the, the it's way better, I thought. Well, and it might be just the spots we went to, but we I, I just it, it was so fun like see seeing snorkeling through Enzo's eyes, you know, just um being there with him, watching him experience it was just amazing. And Lino too, Lino. We didn't, you know, I feel like three-year-olds always feel left out because they can't do anything. And they, <laughs> our our um, boat trip put Lino in a wetsuit and got him out there to see the manta rays. Yeah. And, like, made it so he could participate. And it was... It was amazing. It was fun. And it was like a village was helping us make it happen for them, which yeah. I feel like is so nice. Otherwise, I feel like traveling can be such a such a struggle. But I didn't feel like that with the kids this time. I felt like it was village effort yeah i thought it was really good so um what do you think was the funniest part of the trip the funniest part of the trip yeah i don't know i mean i think the funniest part of the trip was our friend who i, I don't know if i can name I don't, i'm not sure if we can name him or not but our friend who is like um so alice and i are sort of uh more free range in our approach to life <laughs> and our friend is more regimented and uh, uh, precise and like persnickety but 
persnickety in a way that he's fun to to push back on. Like his, huh. I feel like his family in general is less free range than we are. Like more organized in how they approach things. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah. And so we were like, our family, we were like the, I feel like we were like the, um, like the riffraff that were brought along. So everything was really well set up. We were always running behind and like frantic and they're always have their stuff together. But seeing them get annoyed with us, I, I, I found pretty enjoyable. <laughs> what do you think? That is not enjoyable for me. I don't like to feel like the riffraff. Allison has an identity crisis. Like she, like that's not true. I I picked out the place, got our car, got our flights. Fine, guys, I, but, but but why does it? Like I don't understand why you get so. Like when we made, you know, like we split the dinners, and like when it was our dinner night, I feel like you get wor- you're more worried about what other people think about the food we make than I am. Well, because I'm, to be honest, I'm not a great cook. So, um, and I... She's a good cook. I Well, I, I think I actually am pretty good now. Like, I'm getting better. But I have a lot of anxiety about it. I know, but for what? Because I wanted... I don't want to be a bad cook. But no one's going to throw you out of the house if you're a bad cook. Like, what's the... Re- what are, what's the... What's the worst case scenario? <laughs> the, the meat's a little dry. Like, what's the, it's a zero. But do you think it, like, it does, it, it, like, I want it to be good, just like you want things to be good. And so then you feel like it's a, a minus on your identity if you can't produce a, a, some good food for people. I guess, but, you know. And then she becomes, like, <laughs> she becomes, I've, I, which we yell, this is, like, one of our fights, is that I feel like you become too deferential. Like, when you're cooking it and someone goes, that, I'm not sure that's going to, I'm not sure you want to cook the corn that way. And you're always like, oh, well, like, well, then how should I cook the corn? Like, I want you to say, I know what I'm doing with the corn. Back off. Watch me. But you're always in the, you're always in the, like, how can I make you happy? Right? But you take a one down. Yeah, that is, that is interesting. I do do that. And then also think I'm irritated on the inside. So, like, I feel like it's a problem. (laughs) So, like, I'm sweet on the outside. But, like, why can't you let me do my mother effing corn the way I want to do it? Yeah. Yeah, yes. That's not a good quality. <laughs> some some might call it endearing. <laughs> Wait, what was your what was the most the funniest part of the trip for you? Oh, the funniest part. I think you cutting the pineapple. You should show a clip on this with them making fun of you cutting the pineapple. Oh. Well I did a I did a I did a vlog that I posted that you can watch. But so my our friends brought their parents from India. Um and so I was trying to, like, cut a pineapple and put designs in the pineapple. And his father was like, sure, are wasting a lot of pineapple. And so it was like, a, I feel like it was a good <laughs> cultural experience of him being like, what the hell are you, what are you doing with all these designs? Um, I felt like that. What do you think was the biggest struggle besides the United flight? So the United flight was a nightmare. I thought the um, coordinating, you know, we had... I mean, we had, a, we had, what did we have, nine people there? Right? How many people do we have there? Ten. Ten people there? Like, cor- just cor- getting ten people anywhere, I think, is difficult when you have, th- we had three to 86-year-olds that we were dealing with, right, <laughs> for every outing. And so trying to figure out how to do that so that everybody's, like, sort of ability level was addressed and they could all engage, yeah. I think, was pretty difficult. Yeah. Uh, but given that, I thought the trip went really smoothly one of the things that i liked about it was the adventurous part like i feel like we were way more adventurous like just jumping off rocks and snorkeling and yeah because well, our friends have have a 14 year old and an 18 year old who are like such good kids but but through the eyes of a 38 year old they're nuts and so they're i feel like they're constantly pushing the envelope like they go further out in the ocean than i want to they go super deep yeah they're just (laughs) a little bit more intense so i felt like they were good to like make us not just be in the shallow water the whole time Uh, i feel like it's a good segue to talking about teenagers and their frontal lobes they're that's a thing right they are not fully developed until 25 i mean i know that's a thing but i that is I mean, I think I learned that in Intro to Psych, but that was literally 20 years ago, so I don't know much about it besides, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a fun thing to tell them, you know, that they're, 
not evolved there, but I don't know. I, I do think that they have. There is something called a narrative fallacy where when you're young enough, you haven't seen a lot of negative things happen to people like you. And in your experience, things always work out, right? So if you're alive and you're 18, then you have 18 years of evidence that you have this narrative. And in your narrative, you always survive. And so I think it's, there's been less reality testing at that age. Yeah. When you're 40, you've seen people not survive and you recognize that you're not immortal. And I think that creates some anxiety and that coupled with your brain evolves you think a little bit differently. I just, I've, so I've always never, I've always been like a little caught, like a cautious human. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, watching my, like my twin brother used to do three sixties on a snowboard or kick flips. That just seems like a death sentence to me. <laughs> it's funny. Cause like, those are two things that aren't at all. death. A, a kick flip is definitely not a, on a skateboard. No, I, sorry, on a snowboard. Like, he would go on a half pipe and try and flip. Oh. And I was like, what are you? No. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> so maybe that's not called a kick flip, but. But, but I, uh, yes, yeah. I think there are things that Drew could, I can imagine that he could be <laughs> scary for you. Um, so now that we're back, mm -hmm. we've had a little bit of time, not too much time to reflect, but a little bit. Like, what are your takeaways from the trip? Or is there anything you want to reset, like, moving forward? Like, a mid-year check-in um, yeah. since the trip? I feel, like I, was, I feel like I have homework that I didn't do. <laughs> no, I didn't do any. I've not, I've, not, I've not done any reflection. It was a good vacation. I hope we do another one. Yeah, I hope we do another one. It was really good. Um, what, I mean, what the one thing I, I guess was fun for me is I, my goal was to try and figure out how to vlog. And so I was like, I'm going to go there and every day I'm going to put out a new vlog. And I put out one vlog after the trip was done. Like I just uploaded it. So hard to do that. To like go through your day, find a story that you want to capture, record it, and not ruin the experience. Mm -hmm. That was like an interesting, like I don't know if I can do it or not, but it, it's a goal of mine to learn how to do that. Yeah, I'm proud of you for that because I am annoyed by it too. But I'm really happy with the end result. Yeah. It's, it's hard living your life like you're Kardashian, like always being filmed. You are not always filmed. <laughs> no, I'm glad that I'm not. I feel like I make a little small cameo on the actual vlog. Your buns mostly do. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, but okay, before we, but you need to talk about your book club. Yes, before we go. So, friends, um, we've gotten a lot of feedback that we want to do the book club, and I'm super excited about that. And one of our good friends um, told me about this book. It's called The Body Keep Score. It's number four on the Amazon bestseller list right now. Um, so you can get it on Amazon or on Audible or wherever. It? It's by Bessel van der Kolk. And, David, will you put these in the show notes? Yeah. Um, and it's um, the body keeps forward, brain, mind, and body in the healing of in the healing of trauma. And my mom and dad loved it, and they are not normally into psychology stuff. So um, maybe we'll have mom come on and do a cameo for okay. it because she would she loved the book. And um, I think we're gonna do it the week of July twelfth. Details details to follow on the next shrink wrap of time and place. We'll do it, but I just want to thank you guys for your interest, and I'm super excited to start that chapter. Yeah, so you're going to do it. We don't quite know how to do it. There's was more people that reached out that wanted to do it, and so trying to figure out how, just like from a tech, from a technology standpoint, how you coordinate that, you have to figure it out. Yeah. But, and that's cool. Happy Father's Day, by the way. Oh, thank you. We're going to get, David wants pizza. We're going we're gonna to do some pizza for Father's Day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> All right. Really enjoyed today. Thank you so Thank much. You. Until next time.